Namaste and in la catch, and welcome to this episode of One World in a New World. I'm your host, Zen Benefiel. And if you haven't heard before, which you may have, and you're going to hear it again, Namaste comes from the Sanskrit spoken. It's called Brahmi, and it means the divine in me recognizes the divine in you. In La Ketch comes from the other side of the planet, the Mayan civilization, just as ancient, and it means I am another you. So if we have that kind of understanding that's shared with us from the ancient wisdom, what might we be able to do with that? If we held that in our own mind and heart and how we address and meet others on the road, in the grocery store, gas pump, wherever, what kind of difference that might make in our lives? Try it out, test it, see what happens. Great. All right. So this week's episode, I'd like to introduce Brendan Kumasari, and he is a public speaking coach, which is really fascinating because one of the things on the top three fears in life, you'd think that death were at the top or even divorce, but no, it's public speaking. So he has a podcast called Master Talk, and he is the uh, chief executive and founder of Master Talk and has a wonderful story to tell, I'm sure, as we dive in. Brendan, glad to have you here. Zen, the pleasure is absolutely mine. Thank you for, for teaching me the Sanskrit as well. I, know, I always say namaste and I never knew what it actually meant. So, so thanks for sharing. That was awesome. You know, and I got corrected. I, I interviewed in my previous One World back in the 90s, I interviewed the East Asian uh, dean of um, ASU and or head of East Asian studies at ASU sorry his name was Joy Chowdhury and he was actually married to a, a East or a Western Indian um, and she was a Muscogee Creek wonderful couple but I, I introduced and I always open my show with namaste didn't use in my catch at the time because I wasn't aware of it but I explained what it meant and, and I forget what I, I said, but he corrected me in, in both my pronunciation and my understanding of where it came from, right? And that Brahmi is actually just spoken and not uh, Sanskrit. So wonderful, you know, experience of being educated on the fly. That's apocalyptic, right? Mm. So <laughs> tell me a little bit, you know, with your, um, chosen field and what you're doing there had to have been some things that happened early on in life that gave you an inkling of this inner sense of reality that may have been different than others does that make sense and, and when did you begin to experience that and how did you discover and then navigate <laughs> with it right yeah, absolutely, Zen. Happy to go into that. So, so my story started when I was in business school. I went to university. And my goal in life was never to do what I do today. It was to get a corporate job. So it's not super exciting. You know, I did these things called case competitions. Mm -hmm. Think of it like professional sports, but for nerds. So while other guys my age were playing football or rugby or soccer, I wasn't one of those types of guys. You can tell by looking at me, I'm not really well built for that. <laughs> So I did, I did professional sports for nerds, which was presentations competitively. And that's how I learned how to speak. But then as I got older in university, I started coaching people who were younger than me, mostly for free back then, because a lot of the, the people who were entering this program, they wanted to do all of these competitions too, but we didn't really have a coach. And I wasn't one either, by the way, I was just helping them out, kind of serving in, in the way that I can. And, and, you know, I got my dream job after college ended. But I had the idea for Master Talk because I realized that everything in my head wasn't available for free on the internet. Because a lot of the information here on communication is like, be yourself, get up on stage. And I was like, this is not really helping people. So I started making YouTube videos on communication. And then a few years later, Master Talk turned into something I didn't think would, would turn into. Hmm. Well, it's doing really well. And in retrospect though was there an earlier time in in life where you kind of explored even in a you know a daydream place a, of something of, or of being something different than what you thought was supposed to be in the, the corporate world right 
Yeah, absolutely. There, there's definitely different moments. I would say the one that sticks out was so before I was before I got into universities then a lot of my focus wasn't really around you know changing the world going through spirituality because my focus is really retiring my mom you know my parents were minimum wage workers hmm. we didn't have a lot of money so a lot of my kind of like the levels of consciousness or rather Maslow's hierarchy of needs is probably the better framework yeah yeah where, and... when we start we begin with the bottom we kind of go okay how do we get some water <laughs> how do we get some food right. but what I would say to your question is there was a transition after I got the job. So what happened was after I got the job, and as I kept climbing Maslow's hierarchy of leads and I got to self-actualization, I started asking myself the deeper questions of life, which is what is the purpose of being here, right? For the time that we have left. And there's a great book I read by a guy named Scott Harrison, who's a CEO of Charity Water. It's a nonprofit he started. Mm -hmm. to help people gain access to clean water. And Scott said something really fascinating in the book. There was a quote on this. And the quote was, the goal is not to live forever, but rather create something that will. And as I was working my job, I just asked myself a simple question. Am I creating something that's going to live forever, Zen? And I realized that the answer was no. And that's when I started really transitioning into the purpose that I have today, which is so much more than what I do day to day, but more around how do we create a world, exactly what you're doing with live and let live, where communication becomes the bridge for every human being on earth to become better ways of, uh, of, of listening to each other, of having these important conversations so that there's less divisiveness in the world. Absolutely. 100% agree with you. Uh, and in that process, we find out too, I, I had a great mentor is 20 years. My senior was president of the Association of Alternate Dispute Resolution in America, another attorney, right? He believes that there really is no conflict, that what happens is there's miscommunication. And the reason it happens is because the two parties, let's say, come to the table with two different dictionaries mm. and they speak and listen from their own not understanding what the other is or who they are or why they're doing what they're doing. And so when you slow down to speed up is one of the phrases that's, you know, pretty replicated today. That means to just kind of take it back a notch or two and think about, okay, now how can I understand them better? What are they really saying? You know, this is uh, also uh, Stephen Covey's fifth principle of the highly effective people, right? Listen to understand, then be understood. And we have a tendency to get triggered by certain phrases or words and want to react to those because we do get triggered instead of saying, oh, wait a minute, that's my trigger. How am I perceiving that? And do they really mean that? Well, I don't know. Excuse me. You know, this is what I heard or what I think I heard you say. Is that really what you meant? Right. And just that pause of, of checking. How do you find that in the, the communication process that you're involved with and, and how you've helped others to develop in those ways too? Absolutely, Zen. And one thing that you said that really stuck with me that, that I'll definitely take for, for the future as, as my lesson here is I love what you said around what, what your friend told you, your mentor, around how when there's conflict, two people enter that conflict with two different dictionaries. I thought that was such a powerful analogy because you're right. When, when the lexicon is different, there's no way they can interact with kind of kind of similar with with the relationships, right? When you have a man and a woman, they kind of enter always in conversations with different dictionaries. So, so I thought that was really fascinating, really useful. I, I would say the the piece that I think most people can work on that will help is really the definition of listening. You know, we talk a lot about deep listening. We we mentioned it all the time. Listening is important. Listening is important. But what does it actually mean? So for me, Zen, what it means is this idea of statements versus questions. So what percentage of what we're communicating with someone else is a statement versus a question? Whereas the challenge with most interaction between human to human is it's mostly statements. So it's, I believe this. Well, I believe this, and I believe this, and I believe. So it's a ping-ponging 
of statements. And when we really spend the time auditing, really seeing what percentage of a human being is statement versus question, we'll realize really quickly that 80, if not 90% of what usually a human being communicates is generally a statement and not a question. So the easy way to answer this, I would say, Zen, is we begin the conversation by looking at the ratio within ourselves. What percentage is what we're communicating, a question versus a statement? And the challenge that I would have your audience think about, and for ourselves really, is how many questions are we asking other people at the beginning of every conversation? Mm -hmm. I know that's one of your statements is that you begin every, what are you passionate about? What's exciting you today, right? And those are superb questions because it really gets to the heart of the matter in the other person, right? And it, it just moves all of the cursory stuff out of the way and you get to the meat, right? Which I think in sense that it's, that's it, as you say, it's missing. We, we tend to think about how we're going to respond without questioning and, and digging deeper, unpacking with the other person, getting to know them, and then saying, okay, now, how can I reflect them in me in a way that we can dance together better? Mm. Right? This goes back to the in-law catch, right? I am another you, right? So if that's true, because this is exactly, this is the core of what you're talking about too, right? <clears throat> so how do we do that? Absolutely. I hate to interrupt you. That's why I'm listening because it's so, it's, it's so true, right? How do we dance better together, right? How do we create them? I would say the easiest thing for us to do, because I'm always very empathetic for people who are at the beginning of the journey, as you are, I'm sure, when people are kind of figuring out, like, how do I get to what Brendan and Zen are talking about? It seems like it's far off into the moon, right? Kind of like where you are. <laughs> so I would say- hey guys, come back! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I would say for me, chapter one starts with, make a list of, of the three to five people that you really appreciate in your life and start improving the quality of the communication with them first, because the motivation, the incentive is there. I'll give you a personal example. I was just gonna say, oh, go share, with, share with me your example of that. Because Absolutely. You, you know, we can't teach what we don't learn. And Absolutely. that's part of the process is, is that as we're learning, we're, we're teaching, as we're, we think we're teaching others, we're learning ourselves, right? Absolutely, we can, we can never take someone where we've never been. Right. That's a, that's a great, that's not my quotes for somebody else, but that yeah. I don't have the name of, but yes, absolutely. So, so me and my mother used to fight all the time. And, and the reason we used to fight all the time, but obviously long time, I'm still young. So, you know, we fixed it pretty, pretty young, but, but the reason is, is that the idea of the clash between values, because she immigrated from a, from a third world country, Sri Lanka. So when I was born in Canada, which is where I'm based, you have Westernized values fixated with Oriental values. And there's this dichotomy where you have both of these values constantly clashing right so so me and her never got along it was i remember once i got in trouble as a kid for for eating macaroni at a friend's house like it really made no sense like in my in my head anyways sure, i was sure. like why would i get in trouble for these things so so there was always a friction so what happened because we lived together right i live with my mom and my, and my sister we've lived together my whole life and we've never argued in over 10 years so what changed what changed was not her it was me changing the changing my perspective of the relationship and trying to be a better listener, asking more questions, changing my ratio. Because when I was younger, it was more like, well, mom, like this doesn't make any sense. Like this is what I believe. Versus going, why does my mom think it's a bad idea for me to eat macaroni at somebody's house? Why is that? So I would just sit her down and I think I was 15 or something, 14. And I just sat her and I just asked her, why does this bother you? And her response was actually very legitimate. She said, well, Brendan, when I was in Sri Lanka, there was civil wars all the time. You can't trust anyone. Life was very dangerous. All the doors have to be locked. And I was like, ah, now I get it. She has- that's so embedded too, right? The, those mm -hmm. cultural memories. So Absolutely. that's a different, and asking her the question. So how did that, how did the questions continue and, and 
what did you find out? Right, absolutely. So, so what to your point, right? The culture, right? When you're from that, that shapes a lot of how you live your life later, mm -hmm. and and it sticks with you. It's harder to leave some of those pieces. So, so one of that was that, and I just said, oh, so that's just one example. So when I knew that, I could I could communicate back to her and say, we don't live there anymore, mom. You don't have to worry about these things. No one's going to poison us. <laughs> no one's going to poison the macaroni. You're going to be okay. So, but but I think the key is is it's one piece at a time. So that was one piece. The other piece was, you know, d me dating people outside of our ethnicity, right? So it's like, it's part by part, piece by piece sure. as we develop that relationship over time. So going back to the audience, Zen, it's all about saying, what what are the questions that you can ask more for the relationships that you're invested in in helping grow and then you learn the skill set with the people you kind of have to learn it because you don't want to take your winners for granted the relationships that actually matter to you and then once you get better then you could use that for new people like the conversation we're having now sure now one of the things that i it became painfully obvious that when people sometimes people when they're asked questions they feel confrontation how do you deal with that because I'm Absolutely. sure you, you know exactly what I'm talking about. hundred percent. You know what I always say? Because I always like the easy wins first. For me, it's all about how do we improve our skill set of asking tougher questions? And by, by tough, I don't necessarily mean hard. I mean uncommon, like questions that we usually don't ask each other. So, for example, the question you actually brought up earlier that resonates with me a lot, the whole what are you the most passionate about right now? What it was exciting for you? This actually throws a lot of human beings off because they hear this question, they go like, why are you asking me this? So, so even for something yeah, as simple it, as, <laughs> right, go I'm ahead. I'm laughing because it's usually, hi, I am, and this is what I'm doing, you know, your five second, 10 second, 15 se second elevator pitch, right? And it's like, oh man, that's just, it doesn't go anywhere. Yeah, it's like life, life is so much more rich than just just the surface level, how's the weather, how's the, like, I can't, I can't deal with that stuff anymore. I, even I'm too old for it. <laughs> imagine. So, I mean, so I think, you can imagine how I feel there. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so, so I feel it goes back to, and I'd love your perspective on this too, is going back to how do we first make a list of the three to five questions we wish people asked us more? And then when we have that list, and for all of us, that list is different. Maybe there's somebody else who's listening to this podcast who just loves space. Ah, oh, man, I wish people asked me more questions about my passion for space or something. Yeah. Make a list of those questions and ask those questions more of other people. And, the re and, and don't fear the short-term rejection because we're using those questions to filter the people that we actually want to spend more time with. Like everyone in my network, they love answering what are you excited about right now? And that's what happens is when we start to make a decision of the questions we want to answer, we, we showcase that to the world, the world will eventually attract the right people towards us in our energy. You stated one question, the question statement, how do I ask others what's most important to me? right? What we want to share, right? Are the things that, that are the questions that we wished others would ask. And so start doing that. And the interesting thing about that, in spite of the re early rejection that you mentioned, because that, that happens, right? It's interesting how you'll notice the reciprocation of that begin to happen. Because you're leading by example. And you're giving what you hope to receive does that kind of fit the bill on that okay oh yeah 100 percent. Then, and, and just to add more because you're absolutely spot on there is you know the first couple of conversations it might not go as planned people might just like wince at you and go okay uh, i just want to say i'm good and move on and then like conversation number four someone's going to look at you and say Oh, actually, what's exciting, Bob, and then you're on your way. Right. And then conversation eight, you'll realize, you'll ask yourself this question and turn you like, where has this person been my whole life? I'm sure we've all had that experience. You're talking to somebody and you're just like, 
I might mention like a past life or something. Like I feel like I already know you. It's that state of familiarity that happens because the resonance is there with each other. And Absolutely. that goes beyond anything. You're creating in a, a moment of harmony, if you will. Right? So how do we extend those moments of harmony and move through just like we did last couple of years, right? We went through a period where there was this massive shutdown globally of the entire society and we were all told to be afraid of each other, right? And most people listened. And that's surprising for one, I never did. Never wore masks. <laughs> you know, I played on just exactly like nothing had changed. And so it didn't. My wife and I just, we really noticed that. And then we began to find others who were doing that too. Right? They kind of stand out like a sore thumb when you're out in the public and, what, and neither one of you are, are wearing masks to begin with. <laughs> That's a good I respect that, by the way. Huh? <laughs> I respect that. I love that. Well, I, you know, that's the moral principle, live and let live. I, as long as I'm not aggressing towards you and I, I ought to be able to do whatever I please, right? It's my body. And I respect you. If you want me to stay away, I will. I honor that. But, you know, I'm not going to don, don stuff because you tell me that that's what I need to do. That's aggression. And I, I'm sorry. I don't do that to you. I don't expect that from you so with that kind of attitude to begin with that we're all kind of sequestered and afraid and angry and miserable right it's somebody right because there were all these ways of, that the narrative gave of pointing fingers at different folks here and there to try and vet that anger and yet what came out of it was this silver lining of people going wait a minute this doesn't feel right anymore it, for some of us, it never did. But for those that kind of woke up along the way, I said, wait a minute, I need other people. I, I, I want other people. And how do I find other people that are somewhat like me? And then this whole boon of virtual meetings began, right? Where people started seeking each other out. Now, how do you see that reflecting in... in what you've experienced during that time and, and what came out of it in the in the silver lining that you've found absolutely Zen. you know i think what resonates for me the most from your story is not necessarily the action you took but the perspective and how you live you know i feel that's the powerful piece is it's not about you know is mass good or bad right it's i think it's more about and i'm sure we're aligned here is what decision are we making to maintain the energy and the way that we're being in the world? Right? Mm -hmm. And then, and then through that beingness, we then make a decision that makes sense for us. Like for me, COVID was a blessing as well in many ways. If we choose to see it that way, like in, in my top five people, I met three of them through COVID, right? They, I met three of them virtually, three of my best friends. And I actually haven't met two of them in person yet. I've only met one in person recently after like 18 months of knowing Billy. But I would say that the key is if we choose to find, right, that, that gratitude, if we choose to find that, if we choose to stay happy, because happiness is a choice, if mm -hmm. we make it one, then, then we will live in that way. And, and absolutely, I mean. We have to realize it is one, it a is. choice. 100%. Right? And then to make it over and over and over again, it doesn't mean it won't be challenged, we won't have bad days. One of the things, that you're going to like this. Um, I was uh, on the board of directors for the Association for uh, American Society for Training and Development. That was the old name. It's now called the Association for Talent Development, it's a worldwide training and development organization that, that supports corporate training. Mm -hmm. And I was the uh, president-elect here and uh, for the Phoenix chapter, and I, which made me responsible for the annual conference. And I had, I had this wild idea from my uh, MBA um, in the, one of the presentations was about the challenge to change. I'm sorry, it was my MA in org management. And the team that put it together said, oh, there's only, you know, challenge to change. There's only three letters different. 
And of course, in the middle of the presentation, talking about not being able to keep your mouth shut, I blurted out liabilities, limitations, and excuses. Right. So years later, I had the opportunity. We, we created this event and we called it the shift challenge to change, removing liabilities, limitations, and excuses in the workplace. Mm. And I was just had this, you know, like I say, harebrained idea. I hadn't run it past any, anybody. Uh, one of the guys locally was also the National Speakers Association president at the time. And he calls me up out of the blue, didn't know who he was. He'd heard that I was doing this. And he says, hey, Zen, how can I help? Right? And he says, what are you doing? How can I help? I said, well, Neil, I got this idea. He says, let me hear it. And so I told him what I, I shared with you. And he says, brilliant. Let's do it. Right? And so we did. And it was such an amazing shift in how things had been done. The folks that were there said it was one of the best conferences they'd been to in a decade. And the whole thing is about, hey, it, it, this is the, we have choices, right? We have to recognize, and those liabilities, limit, limitations, and excuses are 99% of the time self-imposed. Very for whatever true. reason and all of them are good we think right so how do you get over things like that how do you share with others how to get over things like that within themselves yeah. so the, there's two parts to that zen i would say the first part is in regards to communication how to remove those limiting beliefs and the other part is really to life so the life one is a bigger question. Let's start the communication. That's the easier one for me to answer. Sure. I, I would say for me, a lot of the limiting beliefs in, in sharing our voice, right? Sharing ideas with other people generally come from um, an understanding of what communication fear means. So a lot of us, when we think about the fear of communication, we think, oh my God, this is something that I was born with. When the reality is, it's not true. Because when we were three years old, five years old, seven years old, we were always talking all the time, right? Smiling, enjoying facial expression, body language. Oh, so, yeah. Yeah, we're having a good old time. Yeah. So, so the question becomes, what happened? Why would we transition from X to Y? I mean, A to B. There's a great I quote on that. I have. I get those kind of comments a lot. Yeah. Oh, you act like such a kid. No, but you did. You actually did it. You did it well. You're in the minority that transitioned just fine. Nothing happened in a good way, where you you always had that gift. But but most of us, we we lose that gift over time. And the the reason, and it goes back to a quote by by a movie called Yes Man, which I thought was really fascinating. Mm, He's yeah. he says the world's our playground. We see we know that as kids, but we seem to forget it along the way. So so going back to this, the problem with, with communications then is the way we're taught it. So when we're in the education system, everything that we learn about communication is, is very negative. Like all the presentations are mandatory, right? Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Jump in. Uh, well, I, I'm, I'm there with you. I'm just, uh, <laughs> I'm gesticulating rather than voicing, right? Oh, gotcha. <laughs> Absolutely. Right. So, so all of the presentations are mandatory. We don't wake up one morning and say, Hey, Zen, do you want to get breakfast and present all day? Like nobody really. Yeah, let's go to Toastmasters. Yeah. Exactly. Come on. Like no one really does that. That's the first piece. The second piece is all of the presentations we do in the education system. They're also different and we don't get to pick the topic. So it's never, what are you passionate about? What do you love to do? It's, no, you got to talk about Shakespeare. And like, okay, this is not very fun. And then the third piece, which is the most important one, Zen, is every presentation is tied to a punishment. So it's not fun. And if we don't do a good job, we lose marks. So this is why the fear of communication exists. It's not because it's some disease. It's because we've been taught it the wrong way. So what's the remedy? Going back to your question. The remedy is another question. And the mm. question is simply this. How would your life change if you became an exceptional communicator? How would your life change if you became an exceptional communicator? Mm -hmm. A lot of us dream about our vacations. We dream about flying to the moon. We dream about the expensive things we want to buy. But when was the last All time we yeah, all the stuff. <laughs> exactly. Whereas when was the last time we dreamed about our communication skills? Yeah. It, and, you know, guys like us, we 
fall into that probably third, maybe even fourth standard deviation in that we do that. Right? We think about those kinds of things. I, you know, my wife's was Russian, my wife's Waffen. Um, and when we first got together, it was obvious that, that like you and your mother, right? There were cultural nuances and differences and ways we heard things and responded and sometimes reacted. And so, you know, another one of the silver linings of COVID, we were together 24 seven. We loved, we had already been together that much you know she had a piano studio in her home and i worked out of the house so we never had to go anywhere except to go get groceries or whatever right and we just immersed ourselves in a relationship and learned how to find the harmony in that we still are right that we we're not perfect yet we still have our moments and yet we go back to that now wait a minute let's get back to you know where we feel that sense of connectedness with each other. Because you can feel the disconnection when it happens, right? That's when, like you're saying, that the question should come up at that point and do for us rather than turning and, and getting projectile. <laughs> Absolutely. And that's more common in relationships than the questions, I believe. 100%. I can't really say because I'm not involved in a lot of them, but I... I, you know, watch people out in public and things like that. It's a, it's a fairly good indicator of whether they're really connected or, or slightly disconnected, just in the observation. Now, how do you see this evolving coming out of COVID, let's say, because this kind of, we started a new world, right? Whether we want to cop to it or not, we're creating something new. We've never been here before. We've got all the available, really cool stuff to do things with that we've never had before. So how do we, how do you see that activity taking place amongst your crowd? Absolutely, brother. You know, what I would say, Zen, is a couple of thoughts. You know, the first one is that the, the way that we communicate is definitely changed. And, and I would argue in many ways for the better. And the reason I say it's for the better, which might be controversial to some, is because it gives people more opportunities to connect, especially people who, who most people who work jobs, now they have opportunities to stay at home a lot and still work and spend more time with their families, take care of their kids. So there's a lot more opportunities. There's a lot more flexibility. And I would say the other piece is, is you know, how I'll just call, I'll just coin this term, you know, the whole great awakening, right? Mm. Where all of us have woken up where instead of waiting until our mid forties for many of us to have our midlife crisis, well, we get to do it earlier in life. Yeah. We get to wake up earlier and, and smell the roses for, for what they are. And, and that creates an, another wealth of opportunities. Well, where we start to make decisions that are more in line with who we want to be, regardless of who that version is or what that version ends up doing, but a more evolved version of what would happen versus just staying in the same spot for 20 years and waking up later. So I feel that that's a, a beautiful thing too. And then the last piece, going back to the quality of the conversations, the way they improve, that that should push us more. Now that we've been inside for so long, that creates that motivation to say, okay, now I'm really going to go outside. I'm really going to go out there. I mean, in the last six months, I probably traveled like 12 times, right? It's like insane, right? And because I just want to go back out there, go talk to human beings a lot more, sure. go to conferences. So I would say from a tactical perspective, what makes the most sense? I would say number one, really triple down on the people that you really appreciate in your life. Because for those two years, you might have gotten to see some of them. So this is a great reminder for all of us to spend more time with these people, to take that flight that we probably wouldn't have done three years ago to California, to LA, to somewhere where they are, and just go spend a few days with them. That's one piece, over-invest in the winners. The second piece, is understanding that communication is a lot more multidimensional than it used to be. So before it was mostly around the in-person and now we're, we're finding those same opportunities in the same way you've, you've met a lot of great people through COVID as well as I have in the virtual space. So never forgetting that the communication skills that we are now garnering that we're evolving together can be used in other settings and, and leveraging that. And then the third piece is just 
clarity, right? To going back to that question that we talked about earlier, how would your life change if you're an exceptional communicator? Don't sidestep that question. Mm -hmm. Really spend 10, 15 minutes reflecting on that question after this episode is over. How would my life change? And it doesn't need to be this big answer run. I want to be on a stage. I want to do, not at all. It could simply, exactly, right? It could simply be, you know what? I haven't talked to my mom in two years. I should probably give her a call. Or maybe it's, I haven't asked all of these passionate questions that Zen and Brendan are talking about to my kids. Why, why don't I try that tomorrow? And once we find those answers for ourselves, that's what creates the motivation. Because communication, and I actually haven't mentioned this yet, is so much more than getting a raise. It's so much more than giving a presentation at work. It's leading a more fulfilling life. And once we realize absolutely. that, we connect the gods. It absolutely is. There's, uh, you remind me of two things when, when you're talking. Um, and, and wonderful points, tasty tidbits is like a, is what I like to call them, right? Uh, tasty tidbits of transcendence. Because um, if you do those little things, and that's all it takes is the little things and the big things will take care of themselves. So a couple of things that, that remind me of, I have a good friend, his, uh, he goes by Swami Beyond Ananda, he's a new age comedian, been doing it for 35, 40 years. And he talks about the great upwising and the, uh, the great we set because mm. we're all doing it together. So it's a different way of, you know, looking at, at something. Mm. And I had another dear friend is on the other side for some years now. He said, you know, there's no ego without we go. And as you think about it, ego is, you know, we're taught that that's not the best thing. It's for our, our protector and our leader. And, you know, we need to have it. And yes, we do. And yet, I think Aurobindo calls it the supra ego, but it's the we go that brings us into that state of being with others at a whole different level. This is that multidimensional side you're talking about. And it's not just on the structural side of things in the physical world. There's actually, you know, the whole sensory apparatus that we have that we don't use. Our bodies are instruments. We just don't know how to tune them, let alone play them in concert, right? So how do we do that? How do we get the geek <laughs> with the jock right and, and get them to play together i felt the same way right it, and and when we do when we find those points of order let me let me flip this around how do you find those points of order within the conversations that you can then branch out into a deeper intimate maybe even for lack of a better spiritual or multidimensional conversation with another where you can touch on things that are in those ambiguous ambiguous places and you're dealing with the ambiguity absolutely and and i would say for me Zen, it's a fabulous question it's all about developing that muscle over time kind of like going to a gym right so and and a good principle that people can follow that's simple is the more you know the more you can relate so the more you know about a subject or an idea, the easier it is for you to lay. So an example with our conversation, I probably wouldn't be able to operate at the same level of consciousness. I, I actually don't think, I think you're much higher than I am on levels of consciousness, but, but I wouldn't be able to operate and have that conversation with you if we were talking five years ago, right? Mm -hmm. so, it's, so it's all about, not to say we wouldn't have had a conversation, but more in the sense of it would have been harder for us be, sure. because I'm not at that level. I would have been truncated that. rather than flowing yeah, sure. as we've been. <laughs> Right? Absolutely. I love that. I love the way you praised it. So, so that's the, the idea is I would, I would challenge people to think about, think about the people, start with the relationships you have and say, how can I relate more to, to the people around me, the people I really care about? Cause that's what creates the motivation. But then what happens is that the circle slowly increases. So it starts with a smaller inner circle where we improve the quality of those relationships first. Cause that's the easy you know, return for all of us in happiness where we're like, okay, the people around us are happy. Okay. Now I'm happy. Now what? Now we go to the people we agree with the same political views, the same religious view, the same uh, people in our area, then go to them and then improve the quality of those relationships and then slowly increase the circle. But then, then we start entering levels of challenge that are much more difficult that probably smaller people would be willing to, to gravitate towards. 
but yeah, live and let live, right? So then we start to enter areas that are much more challenging, which is um, look at a belief within yourself that you very much are a hard head on and then analyze the opposite belief and defend it. Now that is where we get challenged, right? Like a, an example, well, I won't give sure, too Because we are constantly looking for confirmation bias. Correct. Right. And when we get that, we're fine. If we're challenged, it's like, wait a minute, I got to, ooh, I don't know. <laughs> Let me think about that. Ah, right. Now that is kind of what I go through, right? And the truncated. What I find normally happens with that is there's this, oh, I don't know. Uh, no, I don't, that, right? And there's the two dictionaries. Right, perfect example of it. And the unwillingness, there, there's two things that we need in order to have, uh, let me do this. Let me flip that around into a question. What do you think about psychological safety and intellectual humility? Love, love both of those terms, psychological safety and intellectual humility. That, I mean, you touched upon that so well, just with that question. Those are, those are the keys, the cornerstones that allow us to level up, so to speak, right, mm -hmm. at a conscious level. Because when we get to a place where we start arguing the opposite end of the view, the, the other side of the, the plane, and we start trying to defend them, that's what really helps us develop the, those two traits that you talked about over mm -hmm. time. And and it's traits that I'm still working on that we're still working on as well, well right? I, to you know, I'm still right. <laughs> Absolutely. And and I think that's the challenge, right? Is most of us have trouble to keep pushing the bar on what's possible. There, there's a great quote on this that I'm definitely going to butcher: is that the beliefs that we should question are the often the ones that we should that we never think to question at all. Absolutely. Right. And I, 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 I <laughs> started to go into the Frito Bandito ditto, right? Or ditty. Um, how I turn that is we take our truth, we throw it on, put it on chopping block and whack away at it. Mm, I love that. Very right? simple. We have to be willing to do that and try to destroy what we believe to be true. How often are we willing to do that? Right, because we're for whatever reasons, whether it's the fear of we might be wrong, right, or we might learn something new, mm. and, and just the ability to suspend your beliefs in a moment can offer huge insights, especially in one's listening. Mm -hmm. And, and what you said there that was actually so gold that, that I want your audience to really double tap on is you said how often, right? That's the key, right? Especially the truth and the chopping block is it's not a one-time thing. It's a constant and evolving process that never ends because there's always going to be a belief that, it, that whether you believe or I believe or anyone else believes that will continuously be we must keep chopping away at and it's that constant evolving process that prevents most of us from getting to the highest level but i would say the easiest thing that people can do is to start that journey sure sure and, and what i've found and maybe you have let me ask you this have you found that it turns into an experience system as opposed to bs mm. An experience system. I would say for me, Zen, it's more about like I I, I have a more um yeah, you're definitely more spiritual than I am. That's why I've I've learned so much from our conversation. I think for me it's more like like I'm more I have a I don't have a good term for this. I've ever chilled out approach to this. So here's what I mean by that. Okay. In the sense of like, let's say we take like like a uh -huh. very Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have a more chilled <laughs> So what do I what do I mean by that? I'm not saying like that's the right way, just the right the the way of phrasing it. In right. the sense of uh, the the conversation that always goes in my mind, Zen, that I'm sure anyone who's listening to this can relate to, is like let's say there's someone you fundamentally agree disagree with on everything, religion, politics, mass, no mass. Like let's say they're the opposite to you, but at the end of the day, even if they're the complete opposite and they live in the same country as you, they probably still eat the same Big Macs. 
they probably still go to the same restaurants. They probably still go watch the same movies. They probably watched Game of Thrones last week too. And and when we start to really realize that, and I think a lot of people who do realize that are often travelers. They travel to many countries. Mm -hmm. They realize that at the end of the day, going back to what you you embody, live and let live, and I try to as well, is that we're all just one humanity living an experience. And and the 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 divisiveness that is outlined by the media is nowhere near the actual divisiveness in our society, which is actually very tiny mm -hmm. and, and, and almost a rounding error, I would argue, in many cases. But that rounding error is so emphasized that we're led to believe that we're so different when we're actually just one and the same. And right. we, we're just looking at the coin from a different angle, but it's the same coin. Absolutely. Now, do you find that in this, the, the process that there's um, a deeper awareness of the additional, how can I put it? Um, because it's almost, at times you, there's a certain amount of speculation, the, the what if, mm. right? And which comes in the midst of ambiguity, right? Because you're not sure. And you wonder, well, what if? How do you progress with that? Because I know those kinds of that kind of question, even though it's a two-word question, right? Yeah, ellipses at the end of it before the question mark. But what if? How how do you get to that place? And what might be a process that folks could use for that? Absolutely. I would say an easy way to start this, like the easy implementable ideas is I would say the first one is starting with everything we have in common. That's always an easy place to start. You know, so commonalities around cities, around who you are, who you're being. So then once we find all the commonalities and we realize that we're very similar in many ways, then when we start to explore the the harder conversations, right? The what ifs, what if that scenario, what if you believe this? What if we go into this? It'll be easier for you to navigate or for us to navigate together mm -hmm. as a society. Kind of similar to uh to a romantic relationship, right? You you always want to address the small little bubbles before the there's a big bubble that pops, right? Exactly. Because if you do all the small little things, okay, well, honey, what bothers you? Well, I hate it when you take out the trash in this way, do it this way, right? So when you when you're willing to dust off the little speckles in a relationship when the bigger thing comes up that you've already practiced dusting off things together so you have that language you're using you're learning to use the same dictionary to use your words right, right rather than two so that when the harder conversations come up you're not smacking those dictionaries on on each other instead you're actually sitting down next to each other you're both nervous but you're trying to read the dictionary together <laughs> and figure out this craziness of a it's word like the word. difference between cold pricklies and warm fuzzies right and you know when those happen in a yeah. relationship and, and so you adjust and you figure out, okay so what do they do how do, how can i be different than that? how can i be better the next time now you mentioned that you know this connectivity the community the the recognizing that you know we're all eating the same kind of food going to the same kind of places doing the same kind of stuff do we ever consider how our bodies came to be and how that reflects our planet and that in that perspective, you know, we're 99% space. We're talking about the numbers side of things, right? And so looking at that data, what might that allude to in the scope of our commonality and what flows through us from the nutrients we get from the planet and its animal life or, you know, the plant life and all the things that actually make our body up. We are the earth. Right? Where, where else would we get our stuff? Right? It just doesn't, we don't precipitate it, do we? Mm. Right? Fat. How does, how would that, do you think, change if people were to look at things from that perspective? What might change in our behavior and how we reflect our relationship with each other in the planet? Mm, that's a fascinating one. I, I would love to ask you the same question as well, because I'm sure both of our answers are kind of complete each other's. I would say the one that's coming to mind right now is more in the sense of I find that – I'm not sure if there's a direct correlation with this end, but it's helped me mm -hmm. in the sense of when, when a human being is solely focused on where they live 
and who they are and the life that they're living and they're focused on that the world the world centers around that reality so if someone comes in with a different point of view let's use an extreme example let's say a cult right whatever not going to name names not going to name a cult let's say that it's such a small society and the goal is all clearly defined so if someone comes in with a point of view that is even slightly different than that then it creates chaos mm. and, and chaos in a bad way for the people for that smaller community but then you have the other extreme which is somebody like elon musk right and i like him because he's like a poster child that people can relate to where sure. he's in an interview and he would say something like that that most human beings wouldn't really even dare say is like you know, I feel that as a human race, that in the next two, 300 years, we might not be able to become a multiplanetary species. So I think it's important that in my short existence, that I make us a multiplanetary species. Isn't that like a very bizarre thought when you think about it? Like he's so, in, it in a good way. depends on the elevation of the consciousness in the individual and right. how they've been able to progress with it. Correct. Right. So, and of course he wasn't diminished like most of us are. Right, we we pop up in schools and, and in the old educational system, which wasn't holistic by any stretch. I don't know that it is yet, because we're still, you know, we have the mental health, the emotional. We don't have an emotional health system, mm. right? And that's really what affects the mental health system. And so we have body, mind, spirit, and planet that ought to be together in that holistic educational process, and yet it isn't yet. And I see signs of it. I wrote a business plan about some, uh, an environment like that after I taught high school for 10 years. And at that time, I, I took it to the uh, head of uh, education for the Child Protection Services for Arizona. And he says, Zen, I love it. You're light years ahead of us. I don't know if we'll ever get there. And so I, there was a bittersweet, you know, response in, in that. 20 years later, I got a chance to produce, to present it at a, a, re, a regenerative community building festival, virtual. Mm. So there's still some interest. And still, it seemed like it was ahead of time, right? Because they're focusing on regeneration, not necessarily education. And the education is part of the regeneration process. So I'm still hopeful, right? That we plant the seeds and we, you know, just kind of wait for them. And, and you know, and they will return eventually. So how do you see this process of bringing humanity in some way, shape, or form back to this awareness of more than us? You know, we were talking, uh, let me preface that just a little bit more with mm. we're more than our mind and our body, right? There's a consciousness. Absolutely. So, so there's two parts to that, Zen. One part is going back to Elon's point is because he's able to look at humanity from millions of years of a span, the reality in how he lives his life is different than most of us, where he goes, oh, no, we're all just one human race living a shared experience, and we're all moving towards one consciousness at some point, so uh, we might as well go to Mars so, so that we all live, right? So he looks at the zero to one. But the other piece to that, which goes to, to your question, is how do we how do we bring us to that oneness? Everyone's got their own perspectives on this. I, I won't give you my my uh, my my PR version, which is we should all love each other and sing kumbaya. I, I think personally the solution is is and this is how I live my life, is so long as we protect the next 10,000 geniuses of our society to move move the human race forward and all of them are have that level of consciousness human the human beings will adapt to that culture what do i mean by that if the people that we admire in a society are have operated at higher levels of consciousness it would solve a lot faster where the people that we admire growing up we want to become so so i feel that's the solution that's really the focus for what i do is really is really making sure that my free resources in particular get to those those elon musk those zucks those whatever in every area of excellence so that those people yes. all accept right Kumasamis. <laughs> Kumasamis. thank you brother and it all trickles down to the rest right, of right, right. yeah yeah and it's a wonderful thing when when that happens you know Kardashev, uh you're 
probably familiar with him, the Russian scientist that developed the typing of civilizations, type one, two, and three, and there's a four now, I believe, but it, that's come from that. But the type one uses planetary energy in order to meet its needs. A type two uses the solar system's energy, and a type three uses the galactic energy. So considering that we're at a, maybe a point two, point three, if we're lucky, it's also the consciousness that develops along with that to incorporate the greater whole and understanding maybe a little bit more of that space in between the points of light or the proton, electron, and neutron that make up everything. It's interesting that, you know, that fits the trinitized model and yet hydrogen is still missing. But when you look at where hydrogen shows up, it's the most plentiful gas in the universe. It powers the sun and it's the bonding agent for a DNA helix. So how does that all correlate? And yet it does somehow. We haven't begun to even explore how or why it might, right? Or that there really is no junk DNA. It's just waiting for us to reach a level of vib vibratory rate right, which we all have different frequencies, and, and we're kind of like a big tapestry. The oneness concept for me is like we're in this big tapestry, we're all individuated threads looking for our perfected form, fit, and function so we can dance together in this wonderful waltz or wh whatever style of music you would like, right, and, you know, there may be a waltz over here, a tango over there, so, you know, some boogie down over there, whatever, um, <laughs> but we have that capacity now because we have the understanding that science is pretty much echoing what the ancient texts have talked about that we end up calling spirituality, not really in science, it's philosophy. And science wasn't called science until the 14th century. Previous to that, it was philosophy. So if we understand the philosophy of working together better towards harmony among people and planet, maybe we could actually do so. What do you think? I love that. I think that's a great, great statement is when we learn to dance with each other, when we learn to have those, those conversations and we enjoy the beauty that is life, really, it, it allows us to slowly step into that oneness. And, and hopefully, you know, we, we get to see that in our lifetimes, but I, I think we're, I think COVID has brought this awareness that we're all one, one, one population. I think we're that's poised the for the great reset and an evo leap in our capacity right to recognize what can happen and that uh, from a perspective of time i this is something that it, it, you'll love this because you mentioned it just now about how when you're working all together we can get stuff done sooner right from the perspective there's a guy named William, wilbert um Smith, who was Canada's UFO investigator director or investigation director, um, it was Project Magnet, I think it was called Power, or it was uh, funded by the Ministry of Transportation, 1950s. Right? And he had conversations with what he called people from elsewhere. And he had memoirs, it was just, you know, things that he was jotting down about it, really intense stuff. And I'm sure he never thought that they would get published, but two years after his death, somebody did. 1964 is when it happened. So what, one of the things that they said to him is in their consciousness, time is a measurement of the change of entropy. Which would seem to mean that the less entropy there is, the more you can get done in shorter spans of time. So as we come together better, you know, as we, as you were saying earlier, you know, we wake up and, and we're that better person the next day and we're striving for that, then we can actually have huge change in a matter of 10 or 15 years that we, I mean, look at the changes that we've gone through in the last two centuries and how it's sped up Drake's equation, even, right? Absolutely. The computer world. Um, so all of these, uh, bring us to this next level. How do you, how would you hope, how do you see, and how would you hope to see this process taking place in your own life and your own activity and trickling out into those that you know? 
Yeah, it's a beautiful question, Zen. You know, for me, I would say that it's this quote that I, that I wrote somewhere in my basement a few years ago, and I felt that it, it stays true to this day. Some and basement the, tapes, huh? Yeah, basement tapes. A lot, a lot of the stuff I come up with comes from my basement, where I'm currently live, by the way. Yeah. But, the, but the quote is, the easiest way to solve the world's problems is to do just that. Focus on the easiest ones first. You know, I feel a lot of us, we focus too much on, oh my God, we got to solve this. Oh, I'm passionate about this. I'm passionate. Whereas, you know, my utopian society, you know, what I'm trying to create in the world is if the t smartest 10,000 people who can move the ball in society forward, all just sat down, we just debated the world's easiest problems. Like not the most pressing problems. What is the world's easiest problem? What can we all agree on? It would be so much easier to get by in. And that's why I'm so passionate about what I'm solving for. Because no one's going to go against me. It's like, oh, Brendan, you shouldn't share free communication with the world. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah, so I think, yeah. the, I think the answer is figure out a problem that we can all get behind. Like think about the legalization of gay marriage, which is such a beautiful thing. Right. The reason it got it got solved so quickly, everyone was behind it. Yeah, only people very, stood up. That's yeah, how things happen. Up. That's the key. So we just need to find those opportunities. What are the other problems that we can all agree on? And as we do that, kind of like with the romantic relationship thing, where we 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 pop those smaller bubbles, we can slowly move our way up to the pressing the harder issues. Let's let's talk about those smaller bubbles for just a moment and bring it back down into a localized. Okay. Mm. And, and, Mark and I've talked about this. He says it in all his speeches, you know, in these systems, we need to give people the power locally to do whatever is necessary in their environment to solve their challenges, whatever the, they may be. And once they choose, for instance, uh, and he uses this example, um, the abortion issue, right? If you find a, a community that decides, no, we're going to be pro-life. Okay community next to them may not be. Well, if you need, you know, if you really want to ha have an abortion, then you need to go to that other community and either travel there to get it done or to live there, right? So there's options in the place, but, and being able to bring those issues that we may think are global down to a local level and solve them in our own communities, that ripple effect is going to be huge. Absolutely. Now, how can we, how do you think we can do that? I, I realize, you know, we're not really community developers and yet we have a good idea or, or fairly good sense of how humanity, of how people interact and work together. Absolutely, brother. You know, you know what I would say is a quote by a guy named Ali Gadet, and he says that if you help one person, the world will give you permission to help everyone else. And I feel your example really embodies that where you don't need to go to impact billions of people. You can start locally and find that one person that you can serve. And, and part of that is having the self-awareness and the empathy, right? And, and I know you talked a lot about intellectual humility earlier today and psychological safety, where you're having these conversations with people and you're really figuring out what's really bugging them. And then uh, what's, what's, what are they challenged with? What are they, what do they have troubles with? And then balancing that with the problems or the skill set that you have to then bring a group together and, and create those, mm -hmm. those, those milestones. But then the other piece, which is important to the community building piece, which I'm sure you talk a lot about is not just making the progress, but communicating that progress in a way that gets more and more people to join the movement and get excited about right. pushing the ball forward and faster. Another perfect example of those kinds of things. One of my other hats, I'm a mini hat, well, as you might imagine. <laughs> my hat has got nothing on me. I'm a, I'm a mini hat. Uh, <laughs> the partnering sessions that I've done for building road, bridge, and, and waterway construction, national parks as well, um, still, that's just a location, but the same kind of thing, their production, construction, stakeholder teams and so they've all got a part of the advancement and, and the building of whatever it is right so my job is to get them on the same page mm. and so in the development of that it's what in order to solve a problem what's the least common denominator right and you, you break things down and you start from that place and then build up you can see the issues coming and often 
especially with a two to five year project, which is what most of these projects last, there's an awareness of when those particular issues are going to come up. And then through the process that I take them through, they have a solution in place to apply so that there's no work stoppage. Right, so that kind of look ahead, let's see, you know, what, what rears its ugly head initially and how we might be able to give it a bath and, and put on some new clothes or whatever, right? And, and make it feel better. Um, then we can begin to break down that resistance to working together because you've got a solution in hand and you don't have to be concerned about it when that time arrives. Now, how do we back that out it, into you know personal lives and and uh, in our environments our, our work and, and you know even remote working you still you're dealing with people generally on either virtually or phone or whatever not to mention your family so how do we how do you think we can bring back that kind of look ahead as to okay might what might we encounter and how can we prepare for it so that if it does happen that we're not blindsided by it Absolutely. You know, you know, what I would say, Zen, is it's all about two things. One is understanding the power of the double effect, which I'll get into. And the other piece is knowing that when we write down those worst case scenarios, we're able to better adjust the risk that might happen. You know, the, the best founders, the best movement makers, Gary Tan talks a lot about this. They're pessimistic short term, optimistic long term. So what does that mean? That means they're always paranoid or like, oh, these little things will go wrong. But they're super optimistic that, you know, if I do this for five years, this is the change that I'll create in the world. So that's one piece around what's our mindset short term and long term. And then the other piece is people really underestimate the power of doubles. And what do I mean by doubles? I mean, if you help one person, one turns into two. If two people tell two, it'll four. And then if four people tell four, it'll turn to eight, 16, 32, 64, and you'll just keep doubling. Mm -hmm. If you do that 24 times, you'll have a pretty big number there. It, it's just, we need to be willing and care enough about the problem we're solving for to force that doubling effect, to show that passion for what we're doing. And there's a great quote as well that I can end my logic on. And the quote is this by Lewis Taus, the world will always make room for passionate people. If you're really passionate about what you do, think about me. Like I started making videos when I was 22. Like what? Like how does that make any sense, right? So when we when we are passionate, when we really care about the problem we're solving, and we're genuine to those first two people that then turn into four and increase over time, we'll eventually win out in the end and win out in 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 the way of impact for other people. Absolutely, and great advice. Wow, Brendan, it's been, my time has disappeared. Yeah, it was like, oh my God, what happened at the time? Right, right. So much fun, so much fun. And absolutely. And, and, you know, speaking of the doubling, the first thing that came to mind was this platform called LinkedIn, right? It's underutilized in that way, in my opinion. It's getting more that way, or at least it is for me. I mean, that's how we got here right we didn't know each other from adam a few days ago or well it's probably been a little longer than that but right and yet here we are it's like wow we're kind of talking the same language or the same ideals a little different language we're finding some uh commonality in it and we're looking at some of the issues that we knew we had previously that would have kept us from being here and we got those effectively out of the way or at least we think we have right <laughs> <laughs> for, sure. for now right? um, tomorrow it yeah, may be a different story and yet we have that effect and the effect we've had on each other i think has been profound because we've enjoyed this to such an extent and i think it's evident absolutely this is super fun Zen. i really appreciate this conversation i learned so much from a lot of the insights that you shared as well so so i definitely leave this conversation refreshed as well oh good good let's uh let's keep that ball a rolling right let's see what kind of ripples that, that we can make in the thoughtmosphere <laughs> absolutely brother 
All right, Brandon. Well, again, so appreciate your time and uh, everything you do. And I will have your information below the video um, so that people can find you, check your podcast out, and uh, we'll have a great time from there, eh? Amazing. Amazing. Thanks for the time, Zen. This is great. Oh, you're welcome. And namaste and in la catch. Thank you so much for sticking with us through this episode of One World in the New World. I'm Zen Benefiel, your host, and I will see you next time.